Hello there, and welcome to another week of Behind the Mic here on Amateur Sports TV. I'm Jonathan Hodson, back with you for another week and a conversation with another sportscaster. Many thanks for taking another evening of your holiday season out with us. Last week, we had Ben Steiner on for a live Christmas Day episode talking World Juniors. And tonight we have another fun one for you. It's Winnipeg Jets radio color analyst Jamie Thomas kicking off 2021 here on Behind the Mic. We have really good chat lined up. We'll talk about his new gig with the Jets, a little bit of his backstory, and you may know one of his previous jobs, of course, anchoring Sportsnet. We'll get into some of that, and there might be a little bit of talk surrounding the Winnipeg hockey scene. So before we get going, we're going to take one more break and bring in Jamie. But before we get going, we'll remind you that you can follow Behind the Mic and Amateur Sports TV on the ASTV website amateursports.tv as well as their social media networks facebook youtube and periscope so we're going to toss it to break one more time and on the other side we'll have jamie thanks for watching behind the mic And back here on Behind the Mic on ASTV, Jonathan Hodson back with you, bringing in our guest for this week, Jamie Thomas. Jamie, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, uh, Jonathan, I apologize for the background behind me. I try to make it look as good as yours. Uh, you know, during this whole Zoom thing, you know how you make your trying to make your office look really cool? Well, I got kicked out of my office by my kids. Uh, they have the big TV sets and are playing video games right now. So here I am. I apologize for the halo over top of my head from the, the bedroom light and stuff like that. But uh, so uh, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks so much for coming on. And isn't it uh, isn't it amazing the kind of things that we're we're learning that we can do in this new world? Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, you're trying to remember if it's one of those calls where you have to do your hair and you you have to dress properly because some some of these conversations are podcasts, other ones are on TV. So it's it's you get a little confused. Here and there if you should be uh, actually styling your hair and shaving but uh it's it's a fascinating time uh you know we've every, i think everybody's adapted quite nicely to this whole new world that we're in right now and but i do i i will say this i miss going into dressing rooms and, and talking to players and um you know having that face-to-face -face conversation you like the pink pillows <laughs> 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 I'm like looking around. I'm like making sure. Oh, is there anything decent back here that I should? It's up to you. We can. It's up to you. We can do either. Okay. Way. Is there anything back there that we shouldn't have back there? No, so, nothing uh, incriminating. Nothing. My wife's gonna kill me for later. So uh, no. yeah. So, but uh, to, to the point I was making, I get distracted easily. Um, it's just I think we've all adapted nicely, but I do miss going in the dressing room talking to players face to face. Uh, I'm sure they love. The fact that we can't go in the dressing room right now is probably that's their space, and they're probably enjoying the fact that they have that uh, opportunity and that freedom to to roam freely in the dressing room without microphones shoved in their face. But uh, hopefully, we get uh, back to that point where we're we're talking to them face to face again. But uh, it's it's been pretty cool watching everybody adapt to to the new normal here in in 2020. And how has your um how has your year progressed? Uh, with with the changes and uh, how's that how's your um, how's your job uh, looked and how's it changed based on the restrictions we have yeah that, I mean <clears throat> first off like I, I you know March 12th the Jets had won their fourth in a row and the next thing you know we're all coming to a pause right the NHL season was put on pause and then you're doing 6,000 interviews via zoom an app that I had never used before, even once, I don't think. And, and then we did that, right? So, and then 
hockey slowly started coming back and the Jets had training camp. And instead of going to the dressing room, we sat in the restaurant in the ice plex, uh, you know, waiting for players to come and do the respective Zoom interviews. You couldn't go into the rink. Um, some guys that, could, you know, there were some guys at Jets TV that could do it because they were within, were within the bubble and they were getting tested every day. Um, so the only thing that's really changed, Jonathan, is just that face-to-face -face aspect, right? We, we're doing a lot more of this. We've done a lot more, a lot more podcasts, a lot more interviews on the radio. Um, still did a lot of writing, um, but and unfortunately, the Jets, you know, they they go in like gangbusters. You play that one right exhibition game in July, and then they're into the playoffs, and it just ended sooner than a lot of people hope. So we've been waiting patiently uh, for how. And we uh, see how this works without people in the building in the respective. At least, the, at least the teams are playing in their respective rinks. Uh, I don't think anyone would want to do the bubble. But as as for me, buddy, like this is it's been pretty much the same, right? It's you're still talking to players, you're still talking to coaches, you're still doing your your hits locally, you're still doing stuff nationally every once in a while. So it hasn't changed that much. Just how everything looks uh, it has changed significantly. I I think I've referenced this on the show before. Mm -hmm. um, but something that I kind of got a laugh out of was uh, watching Tim and Sid one time, and they made mm -hmm. a joke about uh, they talk to each other for two hours every day, but they haven't seen each other in nine months. Yeah, so I know. That's how it is. That's pretty much sums it up, right? You have it. Uh, that's, you know, uh, Toronto has different issue, you know, issues than we do. I've been around a lot of the guys at Jets TV inside our office, but we stood six feet apart. If you get close to each other, you put on your mask. But it's funny how guys uh, like the studios have moved everywhere, and you're watching NFL Network, and they're sitting at Major League Baseball Network. You, you know, they're sitting; they got their whole setup six feet apart from each other, and even ESPN is uh, separated. So all the big networks are even do doing those uh, types of things and uh, sitting in separate studios. It was so weird watching Hockey Night in Canada. I remember during the playoffs, just Ron and everybody sitting in different spots. And I found, you know, Kevin BX is a shining star, but you can't see the reaction of everybody beside everyone, you know, one another. And I, I would kill the – I'm looking forward to seeing when Kevin BX gets back in the Hockey Night in Canada studio, when they can actually sit beside each other because I'd really like to see that chemistry grow that way. So that, that was tough seeing those four different camera slots. But uh, but here we are, right? Yeah, and you referenced the, the NHL bubble – Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting from my own viewer experience, remembering the NHL bubble viewing experience and now how I'm approaching the World Juniors. Yeah. So it's basically more or less the same presentation in the rink, a little more low tech um, yeah. with, the, with the World Junior graphics and whatever in the rink, but same type of thing. Mm -hmm. And at least my impression was I think we were just so starving for anything new and anything live that the NHL one was really well received and it really didn't really didn't bother people because it was new. Yeah. And now now with the World Juniors, we're so used to it being this spectacle, especially when Canada hosts it. Yeah. And now it's the same great hockey. But there's nobody there, and it's the same product we've already seen. So it's, to me anyway, it's a little flatter than the NHL. Agreed. And I, I could even go back to the playoffs. Man, you just miss the momentum that comes from uh, the home team scoring in the playoffs, right? Just the building explodes, and you can't – if you're an – like as a, as a person in the media – you get chills in your back, up your spine too, when the home team scores, no matter what team you're covering, because it's just cool being there. The atmosphere is a thousand times better than during, during the regular season and sp certainly during preseason. So you you live for those, that that emotion to change, the emotional changes from scoring goals and, and what you get from the crowd. And I know a lot of guys, you know, during in the Edmonton bubble and the Toronto bubble, you know, at first you're like, ah, this is not that bad. But I, I agree with you. It, it flattens things out. And at the World Juniors, it is – now it's, like, weird. It's just, And you are so used to watching when Canada scores, the place light up, and it's just, you know, you know, 18, 19,000 people going bonkers. We all miss it as sports fans. We love watching sports. 
but you still watch love the emotion of everything. And I still think it's hard to fabricate emotion when you don't have fans in the building. And I know we don't have that option right now, but when it does come back and hopefully when everyone's vaccinated, everything's safe, we are going to appreciate what we had and then appreciate it even more when you're in that building. Cause it is always special to be somewhere live. I know television has done great things over the past two decades to make things special to watch on television set. And it's way cheaper to watch it at home, but it does not come, come close to being in the arena when something cool happens during the playoffs. So uh, I feel for the kids, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the kids of the world juniors. Some guys, some kids won't be back there again. And I'm sure even though it's in Canada, it's still an electric place to be no matter what. So they're, they're missing out on something that probably won't happen for them again. And uh, it's, it's, it's too bad, but at least they're getting the tournament in. Uh, it's an important moment for scouts to see guys uh, play and against their peers, their own age and guys that are the best of the, of their position and, and in their sport at their age group. So I'm glad they they pulled this off and uh, hats off to hockey Canada and the double IHF for, for getting this done. I know there's been some controversy with, with Germany, but it's incredible that they've got this done so far. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about great atmospheres and how mm -hmm. great it's going to be when we get back to that. Um, getting a little bit closer to your story, you have a front row seat to one of the best atmospheres in hockey mm -hmm. uh, with the Winnipeg Jets. And we, we mentioned it a little bit off the top, but filling it out a little bit, um, you've been involved um, in the past with Jets TV and now moving into the radio color analyst job, what um, what's that like being able to to cover the the Jets up close and a rabid fan base like that? Jonathan, I'm, I I remember moving here in in 2017, and and you know working in Toronto, you knew of the Jets, you heard of the Jets, you were happy, you saw it, you knew the stars. Uh, I clearly remember when Patrick Laine had his pre-draft interview with uh, Darren Millard at Sportsnet and he was laying in, on his back in bed. I think it was like three o'clock in the morning in Finland. Like he, he hates that call out. He's talked to me about that before. He wishes that one would go away real quick, but how could you forget a guy laying back while he's on national television set in his draft year, uh, just relaxing like it's just another day on television, right? So uh, coming here, um, you know, expectations were kind of, in the middle that 2017 18 season but when it got going that was a special team I, I i will never forget it but covering being in this building or that bill in bell mts place during the 2018 playoffs i'll never forget it game three against nashville they're down three nothing after the first period and you know slowly but surely they get back in it they tie it up and then they take the lead and it just the that's the loudest i've ever heard a building and I, i've been in the saddle dome i've been in the old rexall place in edmonton i've been in vancouver um, but it, it was crazy. So it, it's been a privilege to, to cover this team, you know, in Canada, you know, especially in a small market like this, uh, it's the bombers and the jets and everything else. Right. So it's, it, it's been fascinating to watch. They are very passionate about this team. Um, just like in any Canadian market, you know, they're not talking about anything else, but what, what the jets fourth line is going to look like in August, that kind of thing. It's been pretty neat. Um, and the, and the rank is only 15,000 people. So it's very intimate, uh, great ownership group. Um, it's, there's, there's just so many ways I could describe how cool it's been, but it's, it's been, a, it's been a privilege. And we had the pre and post game show on jets TV It's a digital thing. You know, they had just started up in 2017, 18. It's, you know, we started off with a little small chair and I sat in front of a Ikea desk and that we, that we did it digitally and we had people on the show and, it grew. Now we have a full desk that costs quite a bit of money and <laughs> have some sponsorship. It's, you know, you know, the digital world, it's been, it's been great for everybody. It's great for people like you to show your talents a lot faster than we would have. I would have had that opportunity. You know, I, I got started in 1998 and we didn't have this stuff. And I sound old when I say that and you, I'm almost 50 and it's funny, everybody, you know, that I work with in Jets TV is at least 20 years younger than me. So I'm like, well, you guys don't even know what it's like. I used to get my scripts and I rip off the sides, the perforation on the side and you'd have two scripts and you'd hand it to the producer. They don't do that now. Like it's just, I, I, I you, when you start doing, you know, when you're entering your birth date and you start yeah. going around the lit, it takes longer for you to find. Yeah. <laughs> you were born so check get out you don't know but anyways uh, 1971 takes a while to get to now and wow. uh, 
it, it's it's crazy, buddy. It's uh, but covering this team, a lot of special players, a lot of special personalities, um, and it's crazy how many people cover this team in such a small city. That's the one thing I always say. I you know, there's no question. The Toronto sports scene is there's 800 people covering the Leafs. Well, there's almost feels like 100 people covering the Jets, and it's just such a small market, right? So it's, uh, everybody wants to know what's going on with this team, and it's it's been pretty fascinating. Yeah, explain a little bit of the the, the change in the difference in feel mm -hmm. between, say, you know, obviously Toronto is the bi the biggest example. Yeah, between a big place, major league city like Toronto, to a smaller place where basically the Jets are it. Mm -hmm. It might be smaller in size, but the intensity must be insane. It is. And I don't think we could ever, each Canadian city has its specialties, right? It, Toronto is Toronto. It's the Leafs all the time. And, um, you know, clearly with a lot of professional sports teams in town, you know, the Raptors are kind of pulling up in there. And of course the Blue Jays, when they're, you know, I had the privilege of being around when they're in 15 and 16 and really rolling through um, baseball that year. And the, the city caught fire as well. And, you know, Edmonton and I was there in 2006 when we went to the Stanley Cup final Calgary you know I, I grew up there so I was around when they won the Stanley Cup in 89 it's for Winnipeg to have less than a million people in it and for the city to catch on fire the way it did it was it was pretty cool in 2018 like the 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 crowds outside the building were almost more fascinating and louder than the people in, out inside the building right so it's just a, the, those street parties that they had just had to be seen, you know, the Jets flying over top uh, beforehand when the playoffs started and, you know, Scott Oak leaning back into the crowd, crowd surfing uh, on Hockey Night in Canada. Like, th th that's pretty cool. And Scott Oak's from Winnipeg, so, you know, he was loving every last second of it. Um, Don Whitman used to call Jets games on CBC when the, the Jets 1.0. He was one of my favorite guys on TV. You know, he called the – he did track and field and on CBC during the Olympics. So he's a legend in my mind. And then you start meeting – all the Jets alumni, like you meet Dale Howarchuk, and you're like, that's that's my time frame when he was, you know, when he was uh, doing his thing. I was 10 years old, so I remember Dale Howarchuk. And of course, you know, I grew up in Calgary. They're in the Smite Division, so every year you're, you're along with you and the Flames and the Jets are in the Canucks and the Kings are trying to knock the darned Oilers off their perch all the time, man. Like there's just, there was so you know, Jonathan, like. I remember in 80, 86, I think it was, when Steve Smith scored in game seven off Grand Pierce Pat. Like, my my mom was crying. Uh, my grandma was crying. We're in her small little apartment in Canmore, Alberta. They We just never thought the Flames were ever going to beat the Oilers, ever. And, like, there's my aunt's crying. My dad's crying. It was crazy when they finally beat the Oilers and then to lose to the Canadians in the Stanley Cup final in 86. <laughs> Patrick Waugh's coming out party. Like, it I don't care what anybody says. It's just we're lucky in the prairies to be a part of this. There's just hot. It's hockey all the time. Vancouver, they have the weather. It's great. They have the Canucks, of course. They had their run. But I just I think being in the prairies uh, and covering the hockey team and being around the hockey teams, the NHL is 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 very special. Well, I grew up in Calgary, so I kind of yeah. I, I kind of appreciate that. And kind of my my vintage um, is the first. I, I grew up a baseball guy and exclusively yeah. a baseball guy until I uh, really I moved to Victoria. So um, were the Cannons still and, around when you were in Calgary then, Jonathan? What was sorry, what was that? Were the Calgary Cannons still playing at that time when you yes, were? Yes, that yeah. was my first that was my first live baseball game around ninety eight, ninety nine with the yeah. Cannons the last yeah. three, four years. Yeah, great park, right? It's like one of those so cool. Uh, I uh, we went to a lot of games there, and I saw I saw Danny Tartable play and Alex Rodriguez play, and and, and so and we you know we went lots because it's just it's nothing. Even in, you know we are our summers are so short in Calgary, so like it's just there's that July August window to see baseball live. But carry on with your story, my well, friend. I, I apologize. Yeah, no, I I got I really excited when you talking about that. So. I could do a whole nother episode on what that cannons thing did for me. Yeah. Uh, working with the Okotoks dogs after that. But right. that's for another show. Um, right. To what, I, to what I was saying is um, my first, uh, the first time that I remember really being all in uh, with the NHL 
was, of course, the 0304 Flames run. Because I had grown up with parents who would talk about the 80s and talk about losing to Grant Fuhr and all that, but we didn't have any of our own any of our own in that in in my lifetime. And uh, then that 0304 run happens, and I remember being a 12 year old kid, and parents drive us down to uh, the outskirts of of you know the Red Mile yeah. and kind of getting as much of that experience as we were allowed to. <laughs> so much you can see at 12, Jonathan. <laughs> exactly. And, you go to the and, heart of that, no parents going to take their kid to that when they're 12 years old. There's, yeah. It's that simple. But relocated to Victoria, but of course you can't really change your sports teams. And no. so being a Flames fan, that's still kind of all I got. <laughs> 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 that, that must have been tough to be a Flames fan in BC. I, I, I can't imagine. I I stay quiet about it. Yeah, it's a silent <laughs> fan. You're like, oh, I could just kill you right now <laughs> if you grip the flames one more time. I will slow you down. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> about will, how it is. I will um, take you out. Imagine yeah. when I covered when I covered the Oilers, Jonathan. Like when I moved to Edmonton in '02. Like that, I'm like covering the Oilers. So my mom's like, "You mean you got to cover the Oilers?" I'm like, "Yeah." Yeah, that's pretty much it. And it's just, it was hard at the start. And they go in that cup run in 06. And it was great from a personal standpoint because I had never really traveled anywhere in the National Hockey League. Yeah, I, I went to games in, in Edmonton, but never. In, and I saw games in Calgary, clearly. But this is my first time really fully covering the NHL. And I'm going to Detroit. I'd never been to Detroit. They play them in the first round, right? And they beat them. And then I'm going to San Jose. I've never been to San Jose, California. It's just fantastic and then anaheim comes up and you're like i didn't go to that one by the way because uh our budget got cut <laughs> here's a great story for you and we're going on storylines in the 06 playoffs i'm working at a channel in edmonton so we go we cover the first two rounds it's pretty expensive but you know we're filing stories from there showing you what how hockey's growing in san jose they got the four rinks there a great story how they've the sharks have kind of built the amateur hockey scene and minor hockey's growing in in, in san jose and then we get to the conference final and they're playing the ducks and our news director says no nope, we're uh, not covering the conference final he's like we're gonna wait for the stanley cup final i'm like what happens if they don't get to the stanley cup and you've we've blown our you know we're not using anything I mean, this is like this doesn't happen all the time the oilers as you know during those little stretch of same with the flames it's been a long time since they've been you know since the 90s since they've had a lot of success outside of those upsets of dallas and, and colorado um in the early around the 2000 area era and you know so i'm arguing with them like we got to cover this no 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 so they beat Anaheim in five games and the Stanley Cup final comes up and I'm like, oh crap, uh, my wedding's on June 3rd. So I couldn't go just care. I couldn't go to Raleigh at all. I watched the Oilers play uh, Carolina uh, on my honeymoon in Victoria. So I missed out on going to the Stanley Cup final play. And my uh, Chris Ledeen was the, the, the other sports guy in the department at that time. So he gets to go to the Stanley Cup final. But I remember being great, you know, game six, they win, they win at home and then they go to, you know, Raleigh for game seven. They don't, they don't win. But I remember by about the seventh game, like inside of me, the Flames fan is going, they can't win another Stanley Cup, right? Because they have five already. So you're like, everyone's all excited. And I'm like, okay, shut up. This has got to stop right now. That's I'm like personally and selfishly, I've traveled to a lot of places I've never been to before, but this has got to stop right yeah. now. So when they lost in game seven, you're disappointed because it would have been cool to cover the, the parade and it's neat to have the Stanley Cup in town. You can do all those Stanley Cup things. Uh, but a little small part of me was going, oh, that's okay. That's too bad, Oilers. You didn't get your sixth yeah. Stanley Cup. I'm so upset for you. Well, Calgary has their one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still have a So I know you're talking about that little small fan in you yeah. is always around when you're covering teams in other cities and it, it never leaves you. Your, your memories as a kid uh with your parents going to games um you know my dad i you go with my mom we stay for the three stars because my parents had season tickets we shared season tickets with the flames and my dad he would go he would go to the bathroom at the 10 minute mark of the third period and say we're out of here every single time every game we went to so i never wanted to go with my dad because yeah. we're you know we'd have to leave before the game they were losing four the players losing four nothing jonathan my dad goes it's time to go it was when New Jersey still had the Christmas tree uniforms. I can't remember what year it was. Yeah. And by the time we got to the car, it's 4-2. And this is back when there's still ties. And we're driving out of the parking lot, 4-3. 
And then when we're finally heading back to Cochrane, it's 4-4, and I just look at him. I go, great stuff, Dad. All right, we missed four goals because you had to miss traffic right on. Super for you. So <laughs> those memories will never leave me. So that's there's always that small part of me that's still a Flames fan um, because of your memories with your, your parents. And I'm sure everyone that watches sports, your best memories are when you're a kid and you're celebrating with your family. Oh, absolutely. Good place to take our first break, and we'll be sure. right back. On the other side, we'll uh, dive into a little bit more of the Winnipeg hockey scene expanded out a little bit and we'll get in we'll uh, get into more of your uh, of your journey in sports casting so we'll be right back here on behind the mic on ASTV And back here on Behind the Mic on Amateur Sports TV, visiting this week with Jamie Thomas from the Winnipeg Jets. Had some fun in that first block, telling some stories and uh, talking a little bit about uh, the Winnipeg Jets fandom. And let's expand that out a little bit on one more note um, about Winnipeg. Uh, Of course, Amateur Sports TV um, specializes in amateur sport and the lower level, the local sports. And we talked in the first block about uh, Winnipeg being a small market, yeah. but it actually has, I think, the most elite level hockey of any uh, city in Canada. It hosts yeah. the NHL, the AHL, the Dub, um, the University of Manitoba and ju- and Junior A. Yeah. So what what's that like? Uh, I guess from two perspectives, from a a media perspective and from a hockey fan perspective, having all that hockey in one spot. Yeah, it's. It, I think the the people here are lucky, right? So you have different price points um, that allow you to go watch hockey. Um, the one thing I have. Uh, being a part of an organization because John and I work, you know, I, I work for Sportsnet and then I work for A Channel, but this is the first time I've worked for a, an actual team um, with the, with True North Sports and Entertainment. So you kind of get more of an appreciation for the American Hockey League. You realize how important it is for development, and you kind of get figure out after a while it's the second best pro league in the world. That's where all the guys develop yeah, that, that that are in the NHL. That's, you know, you can say what, what you want about the KHL. You can say about pro leagues in in um, in Europe. But the American Hockey League is next level stuff to the National Hockey League. And so I've grown to I've been fortunate to go to a lot of the rookie tournaments that the Jets have taken part of. Didn't go this year, clearly because of COVID. But you learn a lot about the coaching staff. So. Pascal LeClaire, like Pascal Vincent, sorry, uh, great guy. Uh, Rick St. Croix, who played for the Philadelphia Flyers, who were my favorite team in the 1980s. Bobby Clark, of course, from Manitoba. Uh, Flynn Flon, Manitoba, was my favorite hockey player growing up. So I loved the Philadelphia Flyers, even though my parents had season tickets to the Calgary Flames. Loved the Flames, but the Flyers were my favorite team. So seeing him, getting to know him as the goaltending coach of the Moose, great stuff. Like just – you get to appreciate that and you go to the rookie tournament, you start to get to know the players a lot more. So the junior age players, the prospects, because you don't get a lot of time to, you don't spend a lot of time with the rookies and the guys earlier in the camp because you're so focused on what the Jets first line is going to look like, how the second line, what's the power play going to look like. So unfortunately, a lot of the guys that aren't going to make the team don't get the, the attention that they deserve. So uh, having the Manitoba Moose here has been fantastic. Um, the Winnipeg Ice came in last year, so you know the West. I'm, of course, will always love the Western Hockey League because that's where I got my start, which was in Lethbridge, covering that league. And then you have the Manitoba Junior Hockey League. I have not been out to a game there, unfortunately. So, you know, you have all this time invested in the Jets, and you have a family. They're young. Uh, my wife is alone a lot because I travel so much, so I can't come home and say, "Hey, honey, I'm going to go watch Manitoba Junior Hockey League game." Or do you want to come out and go, or, or that just doesn't work out. But I think what it does is it's just a great opportunity for everybody to see hockey. And I'm also a huge fan of the former CIS, now known as U Sports, 
Uh, also, the Lethbridge Pronghorns are one of the first teams I covered in, in when I worked in at uh, Global Television in Lethbridge. So you watch that and you realize, okay, these are all these great players from the Western Hockey League getting their education, but the hockey is still fantastic. Like I highly recommend U Sports hockey. I just I can't put it out. There's you know Golden Bears had it seemed like every former captain in the Western Hockey League is playing at the Golden Bears. And the University of Saskatchewan has a great program. UBC is there. You know, University of Manitoba is growing, and they're always a rival. Uh, University of Calgary always, always trailing after the, the Golden Bears. So the hockey is so good. University Cup is fantastic tournament. Um, Sportsnet covered it for a long time, but uh, it wow. is it it's great options for everybody, and uh, and not everybody can afford to go to the national, you know, to a Jets game. Unfortunately, it's just the way life works. Uh, 15,000 seats means you got to make up a little bit. Um, uh, most teams have between 17 and 18 and even 20,000. So you got to make up a little bit place in there and price points. Um, so they don't get to, it. and the Manitoba Moose are, you know, were here before the other big Manitoba Moose are a big reason why the jets are here. Cause when they brought the moose here, they were like, we're going to bring this as close to the national hockey league as possible. They treat it like a national hockey league fr franchise in a way. And that helped lead up to the Winnipeg jets. So, all the stuff you learn, all these options that people have, and especially if you love hockey, I think Winnipeg does a great job of supporting it. Because if you anybody knows Toronto, it's the Leafs, and that's it, right? It's just like you're a Leafs fan. You're not a hockey, really a hockey fan. That's just what I kind of learned from living in that city. So it's tough for the Marlies. It's tough for anybody there, right? And that's why Major Junior Hockey, the OHL, has kind of struggled in in the Toronto area um because it's leafs only right it's leaves first and if you can't get the leaves i guess that's just the way it works but that's uh it's 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 a blessing i think that people have these options to go see very good hockey anywhere at any price point and i wanted to ask about the winnipeg ice they mm -hmm. relocated uh from cranbrook for last season and they're playing out of a temporary facility while their new arena gets built how do you think uh, they've been adopted into the market and what uh, what kind of traction have they been able to get? Well, I I think the Winnipeg Ice had it a, a little tough, right? You're, you're not in a new barn. Um, the, the dollars are kind of spread out pretty thin already as it is, uh, your entertainment dollars. So they, they came in, but they were a very good hockey team. And as long as you keep winning, right, that, that helps bring people in. And then you get your new arena that's always going to help. It doesn't because everybody has to see the new rink. So there's going to be a little bit of growing pains here. Unfortunately, the momentum, I think clearly that they were building gets taken away because of COVID. Cause we, we have no idea if the Western hockey League is going to play this year. So they're under the gun that way as well. But I always believe because I've been too many hockey markets when you win, people will come watch you no matter what. So, and then the new building always gets that in there. So, it, it seems like they have a good plan going here. They have some great players on the roster. That always gets people in. If you have stars, people come to watch. And that Peyton, new building, whenever it's whenever it gets going, it, it helps. Peyton Krebs of the juniors yeah. right now. Yeah. Hometown Okotoks, Alberta. That's my adopted hometown. So, yeah, you're always going to be, like, pumping those guys, right? So, just same like anytime somebody comes out of Lethbridge, I'm pumping their tires too, right? So it's just like a great place, not from there, but it's my adopted hometown because I lived there for such a long period uh, in the early, my early 20, early to late 20s. So that, that's a big part of my life. And a lot of my best friends are from there. So anytime anybody from Lethbridge hits it big in the National Hockey League, I do a little shout out for them. Exactly. So let's talk about you a little bit um, and kind of how we got to this point. Um, so, uh, a lot of people, as we've referenced a few times, will remember you from, uh, I think it was about nine years at Sportsnet and Correct. on the desk at Sportsnet yeah. and various other assignments. Um, but take us back to to the seeds of getting into sportscasting. What was it uh, that directed you towards this? It's always the same story. You can't play well enough to get into sports, so you may as well do this one. It's I can't. You can't tell me anybody out there doesn't tell you the same story. Like you love sports, but you realize you're not very good at it, so you have to make a tough call and, and get into. I went to this. I don't know how to describe this, and I don't want to put it down, but it was. I went to a broadcasting Columbia Broadcasting Academy, and it was. It was just like, I think it was about ninety one. I went, my buddy and I, and he's like, let's just go do this broadcasting school. I think it was six grand, which is a lot of money in 91. 
and you have to play there's no there's no student fees or i or sorry student loans or anything for that type of thing so we go into it and there's news and sports there's three classes uh news and sports commercials and i can't remember the other one it just it was basically it was like ad-libbing every class and every monday was all my friend and i would do you would stand up in front of the class i think it was just to get you used to talking in front of people naturally and it would always be about our escapades of the weekend like our drinking our partying that's what we would talk about in front of the class and if i went first and my other buddy went afterwards he had the same story because i was with him all the time and then people started catching on that all it was was us talking about our escapades and they would call us on it uh, news and sports was uh, greg boner was our teacher and he was like a former calgary uh news and sports because this is back in the day when radio had actual news and sports casts you know on the radio station uh, even if it was playing music it wasn't all talk or whatever so he would teach us and i remember him taking me aside and going his biggest lesson to me was there's gonna be there's a lot of free alcohol in sports just don't get into it don't take the free alcohol that was one of the free for that's the only lesson i remember from him and then commercial writing like we we had to write commercials and it would go you would cut them on reel to reel this is how old this, this class that my school is and we would um put the commercials on air during our shows like one week you're hosting your you're the dj for the show you're doing and they would switch formats so one week could be country next week could be dance music uh the following week after that rock and roll or and then you're, you're the sports director and you'd have to do your hits at 20 after and and, and 10 too so there's a lot of variety in there and it was all radio uh it was great for that aspect but i remember getting out of school going and they told i remember the advertising 75 percent of columbia broadcasting academy graduates find work in, after graduating but they didn't really mention where everybody worked afterwards so it took me i graduated 92 i didn't get into the business until 98. that's how long it took me but i i didn't really try that hard i didn't put tapes out i didn't travel around i didn't try and get a job i think i had that attitude what a lot of people do when they get out of school i should just get a job that's how it works i'm just gonna this is gonna pop in my lap and i was working in lethbridge uh, i had worked moved there with a, a girlfriend at the time to because she was going to university at university of lethbridge and i was working at costco and the lethbridge hurricanes were playing I, I i knew one of the dj or one of the news guys from the tv the radio station that had host the hurricanes he's like hey you want to be the in-house host after a while i got to know him i told him my aspirations and i'm like sure i didn't realize you're talking in front of five six thousand people you're doing you know the brick score to win it was nerve-wracking like talking like with a microphone stand there and i would talk really fast because i just wanted to get there and get out and after a while you catch on you get comfortable with it i was doing promotions there was this dice promotion we had these big foamy dice and it was uh global television celebrities and if you had the matching one they would win a prize i'm going up into the rafters in the arena in lethbridge in the intermission of hurricanes games and dropping dice from the from the rafters to to see whoever wins and i one of my buddies got in the contest one i'm trying to hit him with the dice and that's not really a good idea because you're pretty high up. So I think if I hit him, it would probably hurt him pretty badly. So you're doing promotions. I was doing game notes. Um, and then you're, you're doing, there's a lot of work working for a Western Hockey League team. Working for any team is a lot of work. And I would highly recommend it because you're you're talking to the GM. You're talking to the scouts. You're getting to know your group. It's amazing the amount of context you get from working in a league like the Western Hockey League. I was, and then I was lucky enough to get hired by Global just to do weekend sports. And that was a 98, just Saturday and Sunday, um, to six o'clock, 11 o'clock. And you do that. And it's it was a lot harder than you think it is. I, I, I worked at Costco at the same time. So I'm standing at the front door, clicking people in, checking their membership cards. And this lady goes, oh, so this is your other job? I'm like, yeah. She goes, you probably should stay in this job because you're not very good at the television thing. And I'm like, I was just, I was like a month in that shattered my confidence. I was destroyed after that one. Just one lady telling me that I was just not very good at, at being a sportscaster. So oh, man. a very humbling moment, um, but that's the business. And then on top of the, you know, I'm, I'm working, I, I was in the ditch outside of the warehouse at Lethbridge, you know, the coupons they pass out at Lethbridge. Yeah. By the way, you know, people just throw them in the, in the parking lot. I'm picking those up. That's what I was doing. Some guy drives by on the highway, goes, Hey, are you on global sport? <laughs> I'm like picking up garbage in the ditch. And I was like, going, yes, somebody knows me. So, oh, yeah. so, uh, I worked there for a little bit and then I got the, the color analyst job, um, 
for Lethbridge Hurricanes broadcast. And we would travel. Like, I would go on the bus with the team and everything and file reports on the phone, Jonathan, not on television, not on your phone. I would have to find a pay phone and talk about the, the Hurricanes game. It would be like a 40-second recording. They would put Jamie Thomas, the graphic up, Jamie Thomas on the phone uh, from Kamloops. But I'd be in a, a BP's restaurant at the payphone doing these these reports and hopping on the bus. And Brian Maxwell was the head coach at the time, played for the Jets here in his NHL career. Terrifying guy. Like just, like he was not mean to you, but he was just like this deep voice. And I was scared of him. And I remember this one time we're in Kamloops. I forgot my watch. It was a Swiss Army my, knife watch. It was like 120 bucks. I left it in my hotel because I was afraid of being late. Like I, I knew it was in the drawer. I'm like, I can't be late because I'll get, I'll, they'll drive off without me. They'll leave me here. I, I don't want to get in trouble with Maxi for being late on the bus. And Grant Ferguson was the bus driver. Times like Jamie, you've got two minutes, and I sprinted as fast as I could to the hotel room. Got in there, got my watch, came back. Maxi hadn't got to the bus yet, and I just remember silly things like that. But he, the first thing I learned from Brian Maxwell was, and this is for all journalists, you can't make a statement. When you ask a question, so you can't go, your power play was pretty bad tonight. It went 0 for 4. What did you think was wrong with it? And, and Maxi would just, he would totally go in the other direction. I didn't think so. He would make you look like an idiot. But the point is, is like, you can't make statements if you want a good answer. If you can't tell someone, they're there, they're there to tell you what they think. You're not supposed to add your little insight. So I learned that from Brian Max because I watched him do it a million times to reporters. Because just like me, if you're in Lethbridge, you're learning. That's your that's your first job, basically. And uh, I learned a lot from him and traveling on the bus. I don't know about you, buddy. I can't fall asleep on planes, cars, or buses. And, you know, the trip from Lethbridge to Brandon isn't exactly the shortest one. So if you can't sleep, I'd be staring out out the window, looking at the prairies go by. And you would think that would put you to sleep, but I never could. And Brad Curl is the play-by-play -play guy. He would take a pillow, lean back in his chair, and cross his arms over the pillow and be asleep in like two minutes. So, and then you're looking, you look, if you've ever been on a junior hockey bus, all the vets are in the back. They get two seats themselves. I'm like the old, I'm just, I'm just a reporter. So I'm the analyst. I got to sit, share a seat with Brad Curl. And if you ever had to go in the bathroom in the middle of the night, it was impossible because you would have to crawl over the seats, not trying to get on and like step on any of the players because you don't want to get killed by the coach for waking up the players from their naps or their sleeps or whatever. So I would hold it. You just never, you would never get back there in time. So uh, a lot of late nights, a lot of, a lot of not sleeping. And I learned that junior hockey players have it tough because it is not easy to travel. I don't know how they get good marks in school because they got to do that on top of that. And that's, I have a huge appreciation. And then you learn they're just kids. You, you realize you're, you know, I remember ripping on the power play one night and Brian Maxwell called me into his office like, Jamie, remember this, you're selling the, the hurricanes to our listeners and to our fans, but you always have to realize they're just kids. You can't tear into them like you would a professional athlete. And we, of course, hide them, put them in a high pedestal when they're draft picks and stuff, but we always forget they're just kids. So that time there was great. And then um, from Lethbridge, I went to Saskatoon. I worked there for three months, global television there. And then I went to Winnipeg. I worked at uh, Fox Sports Canada and, and it was the soccer channel. I don't know if you recall that channel at all, but it, yeah, I thought I knew everything about soccer until I went there. And then we're doing Turkish league highlights. And I'm like, what? I did not know how to say the names. And I sat there I for the, the like, I had this list of pronunciations of just the team names. So I'm like, and you have to roll your tongue on some of them. And, you know, I'm getting emails. You're the worst caster. How can you not pronounce this guy's name right? I'm watching, we're doing French league highlights. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? Like, I did not, I knew soccer was huge until, but I didn't realize how huge it was until I'm doing highlights Turkish League highlight, Pro League highlights, and we're doing uh, the America's Cup. Remember, the it's the yachting championship, uh, the World Series of Wet, we used to call it all the time. So that that was crazy. I did that for two months, and I moved to Edmonton. Uh, I got a job at A Channel there. We went on strike. I was there for like two months. We were out on strike for 166 days. I'm like, I'm picketing. I, I've, I'd been there a month, Jonathan, and we go on strike. Like, it's just like all kinds of crazy things like this. I'm like, what's going on here? I just moved here. What do you mean you want me going on strike? We're not, we're not getting paid. <laughs> like, just like it was. I was living off 500 bucks a month. Um, the union made sure you made you could pay your rent and everything. It was, but it was. I learned 
crazy things from that part. It just is how it separates people and all that type of thing. But long story short, it ended after 166 days. We got a pay raise and it was great. And then I, I got married in June of 2006 and I got laid off a month later. So I go to CTV in Edmonton. I worked there three months and I got a job at Sportsnet and I'm hosting Flames games. So it, it, it's crazy how it turned around. Hosting games is like you learn fast. You're doing so many interviews and your interviewing skills get put on. Like it was, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready at all. So it was, I learned a lot of lessons really fast. Um, then I went to Toronto to, to anchor again. And to 2016, got laid off again. And then, of course, uh, I went to radio. I had never done radio before. And you know this as well. Like, radio is a different beast. We're talking right now like it's normal. But it is hard going from television when everything's on a teleprompter and you're just doing highlights and you're taking breaks talking. But they're going to radio and you're on for radio for three hours and you're talking all the whole time. So that, that I appreciate it. And then I got the job with the Jets and, and here we are today, buddy. It's, it's been a long journey. I've been to Winnipeg twice, Edmonton twice, you know, Calgary, uh, didn't like just, I've been everywhere. I've been very fortunate. Um, but if I, I know it's different nowadays, but if I could recommend to anybody work for a sports team or, or, or a, a league or something like that, just it's the best thing you can do to appreciate everything in, in a small market where you can make mistakes and not get assassinated for it um, the way you would on a national uh, spectrum. I know I know a lot of you know companies have changed. They're not moving people around the way you used to. But if I could recommend anything, doing what you did was the right thing to do. Um, you learn so much working for a sports team. I think a little bit more than you would for a, t a TV station and, or or a network. Uh, and yeah, and um, I'm at the point now where I'm starting to to get the odd college student. Um, yeah. come to me on Twitter and like, hey, can we talk about the business? Right. And my my knee jerk thought every single time, and it will never change, is, dude, you want my friends, you don't want me. Yeah, yeah. So some of the some of the mentors have had, but there is one case I remember specifically about somebody who wants to get into baseball broadcasting who's a newly retired college player. Right. And the way I I um, described summer collegiate baseball to him, which is my main reference point, is it's kind of like a car wash. It's like it's not like you're going to show up at 6.30 and call a game at 7. You're answering phones in the office from 9 until 3. You're... I was handling the roster documents for the front office. You go over, you talk to both teams, you do the batting practice thing at three, you do the press releases from, you know, those have to be out by 1030 or whatever. And so I think that's similar to what you were talking about with junior hockey, where you work for one of these uh, lower level programs and you're going to get, such a wide experience of not only skills, uh, but showing yourself that you can do some pretty crazy things. Yeah, it's the it's the diversity part of it, right? It's just it, you need to you learn to do everything. You learn to write press releases, which are very hard to do, even though there's a template. But it's going over every little detail because I've read you. We've all read the odd occasional press release, and you're like, what? this is wrong here. There's like information. It's not as easy as it looks. And the amount of people that do like, there's so few people doing so much. That's the fascinating part of working for a Western hockey league team or a minor league team. There's just, you are doing the job of five people and you have to do it well. And game days are exhausting. You will leave, you know, I left the rink in Lethbridge and I was exhausted because I was there at nine o'clock in the morning doing everything you don't you don't leave the rink of course we would have the odd occasional beer in the in the you know in the boardroom after the game some nights when they would win but man you're leaving there at 11 11 12 o'clock and you come back if they play the next night you're doing it all over again so it's it's hard work but it's something i think you need to do you need everyone has computer skills but do you know how to do spreadsheets for this for the stats do you need to 
you know, the coaches need stats for this, or you need to do this press release. And again, like I said, game notes are a lot of work. You're filling in all that. I know a lot of programs have changed nowadays. You just punch numbers and cut and paste and everything. And it's a lot easier than it used to be, but it's still a lot of work and you have to make sure you're right. And sometimes when you're staring at the screen for an hour doing stats for and a, and a game notes package, you're going to make a mistake because you just, you're just, your eyes are exhausted and you're tired, but it's, it's like going working in from there to working at a national sports network where people write your highlights and all you're really doing is writing on camp. Yes. Like it's hard. I will. My wife, my, my wife's always reminded me it is a hard job because it is because sometimes the teleprompter goes down. You have to ad lib. You still have to be good at getting your point across in a very limited amount of time. And you have to be entertaining. A boss told me one time when you're in television, you're not a journalist, you're an entertainer. And that always stuck with me because I thought I was a journalist. Oh, I'm a journalist. No, we're entertaining people when you watch TV because it's there's so many things to take people's attention nowadays. You have to be pretty good and very entertaining and in a very good mood all the time because, you know, people watch you for entertainment, not uh, just the news. Like we, we can get scores anywhere. We can see highlights anywhere. You have to entertain people now. And I, I got that message and that lesson uh, from Rod Peterson. Yes. Who did the writers for 20 years. And um, I remember when I was little, I remember listening to his radio hits with 960 yeah. before and after the Ryder Stamps games. Yeah. And so, and that big on air personality pumping up that rivalry, that was all I knew of him. Yeah. And then a few years ago, uh, the, the Dogs, my baseball team, was in Regina and he was at the top, doing, at the top of the stands doing his show. And his his producer comes down. Okay, uh, we want you next segment. So I find myself just like just like that on air with him. Yeah. And I figured, okay, you're gonna either, um, you know, you're you're either gonna be timid here, or you're just gonna let it fly and have fun. Right. And we just let it fly, and it was awesome. And it's fun. That's what we forget all the time. Like all we're doing. It is fun what we do, sometimes a little repetitive, but we're covering sports for a living and we're doing a, a job a lot of people would like to do. So I applaud you in that opportunity that you were given to just let her rip because too many people don't. It, you overthink it and it's a great, you know, you're like, oh, this is my chance. But all you have to do is like act like yourself and everything's going to be okay. Exactly. Before we wrap up, one more thing I wanted to hit, and we, we've talked a little bit about it, um, is the people aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, because that, it at every turn in my life, um, it's been about the people. Yeah. And it's, you know, treating, whether it's treating players the right way when you cover them, mm -hmm. whether it's mentors, whether it's those chances to be a mentor, um, I guess two-pronged again um who were um are there other people that you can point to that were that mentor for you or that person that you looked up to and emulated yeah 100 percent. and um like if i could I don't, I don't have like we don't have enough time to thank the people uh that i could properly right gene principe is to me everything that you see on tv right he's he's the nicest man um i remember one time saying to him i'm like why you like you're nice all the time he's like well you don't live at home with me with me and the kids i'm not nice there and i can totally see that because you are not nice to your kids when you're a dad like it's just like it's just i mean i'm not saying i'm terrible to my kids but some days you get frustrated you're not the greatest person in the world uh so i can see his point of view there too and you know there's different stresses at home but gene is you know, he taught me so many great things and I watched him for so long treat people with respect. And I'm talking everybody, coaches, players, and he gets it right back. And yes, you know, he does these crazy things at the beginning of Oilers games, but we remember those more than we do the game half the time, right? So it's like sometimes NHL seasons are so long, you get into game 50 and it's February and it's minus 40 outside and Florida's in town. Who really cares about the game? So Gene does what I think you should always do. You're, you're wondering what he's going to do. He's entertaining you. So I learned that from him and how he treated people. 
And I think the best line, I'll never forget this one time when Craig McTavish was still coaching in Edmonton. You know, the Oilers lose a game and camera guy and me are like, ah, whatever. Who cares what he says? Like, what was he going to say about this game? Well, we missed one of the best quotes ever. And Gene didn't yell at me. He didn't get mad at me. He goes, Jamie, you always, no matter what the thing is, you just always tape Craig McTavish because you never knew what he's going to say. He's very much like Paul Maurice, very smart people. And then you never know what they're going to say. And usually it's very good. And then another guy, Roger Millions, uh, um, he pushed for me to get the hosting job for the Calgary Flames on Sportsnet and pushed for, for me to get a job there in the first place as a host. And I yes, I'd host it, but never at the National Hockey League level. And he, one thing I always, Raj was like my dad. He reminded very much, like very stern, but man, like he loved you, he appreciated you and everything, and he complimented you when you did a great job. But my always, whenever I knew I did something, it took me about two months to figure this out. If he ever asked me, how did you think you did tonight? I knew I did something wrong. It took me a while. Like, why does he keep asking me that question? And he, uh, that that was something I'll never forget. And then there's like produce producers are your best friends. Like that's the one thing that they they never get enough credit. Brian Moynes at Sportsnet. Um, JFK is another one of my uh, favorite producers. Uh, Larry Isaac was my producer for Flames broadcasts. He was hard on me, but for good reason, right? And some guys know how to be hard on you. And you not get mad afterwards. Roger was hard on me for good reason because I made mistakes, but sometimes I get mad. Um, some guys have a talent to to teach you things without you getting mad. And um, I, it's funny how you think about it and you talk about it now. And Greg Shannon's another great producer I worked with at Sportsnet. Those guys, you you didn't appreciate them at the time as much as you do now. And I think producers and APs. Uh, directors do not get enough credit for what they do because they're the ones doing all the hard work while you're having fun on television, right? So it's just like, it's a, it's a, it's a tough business, but it's so much fun when you let it be fun and you appreciate what you're doing. Um, I, that's, that's the, the best thing I could ever explain to anybody because, and I don't, you know, I wish I could be more of a mentor to people. It's a little bit harder when you have kids and the time that you need to, to do that. But I think for the most part, anytime somebody's asked me for help or what, what they think of the business, I, I, I do the best I can to help them out. But I, I think the best part or the best thing you could do for anybody is just always offer a little bit of help because I got a lot of help from a lot of people on the way here. Well, that's a great place to wrap up. And uh, just echoing that, um, you know, really all it takes for, for people in position like yourself is when somebody else who's, you know, trying to make their way mm -hmm. a random Twitter message and says, hey, do you want to hop on my show for an hour? It's an <laughs> automatic yes. <laughs> yeah, and, I know, right? I, I think, you know what, buddy? These, these are, John, these are great because on television, you're not yourself because you're reading off of teleprompter. And sometimes you are. Radio, you're more yourself because you're talking freely. These are, you can be yourself. Like I, I, I like doing these because you can tell stories and that's what being in this business long enough. I love information, but I love stories more. And like that, if, I get, if Dale Howard Chuck tells you a story, you're like just sitting there staring the whole time. You're like, wow, I can't believe he's telling the story. Like this, the story is the best part. So I appreciate you uh, asking me to come on. And if you ever want me to come on again, I would, I would love to do it. I would be honored to, consider you a friend of the show thank you and put them on board <laughs> absolutely well oh thanks so much that was that was an absolute blast hanging out with you today and tons of fun and learn something along the way too so jamie thanks so much no problem there's a nice vacuum cleaner in the background if you want that one too so <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll head to we'll head to break one more time. I'll be back uh, for a solo wrap up here on Behind the Mic on ASTV. At Collins Hotel, we have you and your family's comfort in mind. Relax in one of our sixteen suites featuring king or queen size beds and thirty six inch TVs. Suites also include a mini fridge and other kitchen appliances to make your stay as comfortable as possible. During your stay in Pilot Mound, visit Wiser's Restaurant, our attached family-friendly restaurant and bar. It is the perfect location to host group meals, dine with the family, or unwind after a hockey game. 
Come in and meet our friendly staff offering daily specials on food and drinks, wing night Wednesdays, buffet Fridays, and multiple TVs to watch the game. Wiser's is the place to be. Collins Hotel and Wiser's Restaurant and Bar, located across the street from Blackjack Stewart Arena off Highway 3 in Pilot Mound. And welcome back to Behind the Mic on Amateur Sports TV. We just finished up a great visit with Jamie Thomas from the Winnipeg Jets radio crew, former Sportsnet anchor and reporter. What a great time that was. Talking about old stories, having some fun uh, from his learning from his journey uh, from Alberta out to Toronto with Sportsnet and now back to Winnipeg. So many, many thanks to him for for the time and for the visit. And I know you enjoyed it at home and hopefully our sportscaster types out there learned something along the way. So that'll do it for this week on Behind the Mic. Many thanks for watching us again, making us part of your New Year's of your New Year's evening here on January 1st. Happy 2021 to everybody out there. We will be back again next week with another sportscaster, and we have a little bit of a different format lined up for our for our conversation next week, so you'll want to tune in for that. We are at the same place at the same time every week. It goes, we go Friday at 5 Pacific, 8 Eastern on ASTV. That's amateursports.tv and the social media networks. Of course, Facebook, YouTube, and now Periscope. And if you want to follow ASTV, you can follow all of those pages for all of our other shows that we have going all week long on ASTV. And also you can follow us on Twitter at Amateur Sports TV. And if you would like, you can follow myself uh, where I engage with our guests throughout the week. And I, I pump our upcoming guests a little bit on my own Twitter feed that is at Haji Speaks if you would like to. So once again, thanks for watching. Thanks to Jamie Thomas for the visit. Have a great night. We'll talk to you next Friday.